Okay, Mr. Franklin, have you otherwise had an adequate opportunity to review the pre sentence report and the sentence information with your client? I have, Your Honor. Additions, corrections, or deletion? We do have a challenge. The OB 19. So OB 19 is language. David, has to do with the. Right here, yeah, was he here? Justice, penal institution. So here it scored as 10 points. The offender otherwise interfered with or attempted to interfere with the administration of justice. I don't see that as adequately scored at 10 points. Um, he wasn't charged, I don't believe, with uh, interfering with electronic communication device. When we look at the facts that are in the PSI, and we're not disputing those. Then we have uh, Haley trying to get her phone. It became physical. Doesn't want to say what what we're getting the phone for. So maybe we could score that if we have more information. But I think as it is, there's there's enough information to score that. All right. Well, let's find out what this finds. Well, first of all, he was initially charged with the interference that was dismissed in for the plea agreement. And as it states in the description of the offense, um, they were arguing the victim grabbed her phone and was attempting to call her mother for help. And the defendant took the phone and threw it. Um, police were notified. Uh, eventually, the call did go through, and police were notified because that mother, the victim, was attempting to call contact the police and let them know. All right, Mr. Butler, anything else? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I would just like to add to that that uh, the defense, the allegation of the defense took the cell phone away from Haley in this case, that occurred after uh, this alleged that it had been occurred. Had been occurred. So she had reasonable motivation to make a phone call and try to get out of the situation, uh, but the defendant prevented her from doing that. And I think that's where we fall to the whole thing. So I thought that first part was why this was scored. Frankly, the sentence in the PSI with the defendant. Reportedly took the phone away from Haley and tried to smash it, but then clearly, with the definition of 19, you know, interfered with or attempted to interfere with the administration of justice. But PI, PSI goes on to state, as Mr. Butler, I'm sorry, Mr. Franklin's pointed out, <coughs> that um, she then tried to get her cell phone to call her mother for help, and the defendant took the phone from her. Throwing it against the refrigerator, and they continued trying to get the phone and it became physical. And then the part that was referenced earlier about she thought the defendant answered the phone by accident, but they continued fighting over it. But the defendant ended up going outside. She then shuts herself in the bathroom and spoke with her mother. Also, note in some places, I said at the beginning of the description, the mother called because she saw a FaceTime call that he was physically assaulting her. So I don't, I don't think there's any lack of supporting evidence in the description of the narrative here. The defendant clearly interfered with the administration of justice or clearly attempted to interfere with her using that phone to call for help. How do you need administration of justice? So, Respect that decline to end scoring on 19. Anything else? No. Okay. And just follow anything on behalf of spending, I'm sorry, uh, people are big. Uh, I also have a challenge to the defense for the scoring. Uh, and I'd like to look at uh, 47 uh, regarding aggravated physical abuse. And that's either 50 points or zero points. Um, 50 points is the same as in torture, except for brutality, but similar to egregious conduct designed to substantially increase the fear and anxiety of victim suffering during the offense. So, in this case, it's not laid out in PSI, um, but it is in the original police report, uh, specifically page seven of nine. Um, and it, but it relates to um, the incident that we just discussed here with um, Jennifer Ronan then um, calling to report uh, the incident that she had witnessed um, when that FaceTime call was answered. Not only did she witness things, but when she was um, with her eyes, but she also heard uh, statements that made, and she told the police what those statements were, and she's quoted as saying that she heard the, the defendant yell as he's um, attacking Haley, quote, nobody 
can say to you, quote, they're too far away, I can do whatever I want to you. And then, quote, if they come, I have a gun, I'll shoot them, if they come into my house. So those three statements um, were heard uh, by the victim's mother, um, who is in court today, um, as well as another person uh, closely related to her and that husband. Okay. Um, and so with that, I think that those statements go above and beyond. Um, the actions needed to complete the crime uh, that he's being sentenced for and he needs to be charged for, um, and that therefore does increase the design specifically to increase the fear and the anxiety of the victim. And I think 50 points ought to be scored for that. Mr. Franklin, what's difficult about this case is I've seen the body cam, I've listened to the descriptions that happened from the complaining witness the day off, so much closer in time, to remember is better. And when we look at the description of the man's almost weird to the police report. And, and what do we have? Uh, I threw a plate, I tossed a plate at him, and I think maybe it hit him. No, she says at a different point when it's on the body cam that she threw a plate and hit him in the side. And I don't think she tossed it. She threw it, she knew what she was doing. She started this encounter, okay? And it comes into this scuffle that they get into. Should my client have walked away and not be here facing a felony? Yes. But... She instigated that, and then her description of how this phone got turned on, they were separated from the phone, they're in the bedroom, the phone's in the kitchen, suddenly it's recording on FaceTime. To me, that sounds like somebody's trying to do a gotcha. They're trying to amp my client up, get him to react the way they know he's going to react. If he does, they get him on video. Here he is being convicted of a felony. He shouldn't have did what he did, but I don't think... When you provoke someone and you know you're provoking that person, I don't think you get the benefit of what we said. All right, so the 50 points can be scored if the victim was treated with, treated with sadism, torture, excessive brutality, and then the argument here by people is kind of designed to substantially increase the fear and anxiety the victim suffered during the offense. And that chiefly centers around the argument that statements were made that nobody could help, nobody will get here in time, those types of statements. I don't recall any authority as it relates to OB7 in the scoring of OB7 for conduct that is simply oral in nature statements made. And I also would note that 50 authority that I do recall requires a pretty substantial bar, hurdle, if you will, to get over. I don't know that statements um, uh, that somebody can't help, that nobody will help, particularly when there is, if I read this narrative, and maybe I don't understand the narrative because I don't have the advances of police report, there was an on again and off again struggle for the phone, clearly tying to that the uh, victim was on the phone, including with mother, either before, during, or after, or a combination of all three of the incident. So it's hard for the court to imagine then that the statements by themselves when there is this uh, access and or struggle to the phone, I'm just not seeing that that meets the criteria, the bar, if you will, for 50 points on OB7, so respectfully, I'm applying to a minute scoring on seven. I, I do have a case, Your Honor. What's the case? Um, in people being now, uh, 293 Mish Ave, 292, and 2011. In that case, the court found that the property scored 50 points, and there was ample evidence that the defendant engaged in contact to increase the sphere. Specifically, the defendant ordered the victim to keep her eyes closed. He indicated that the other client accomplices knew who she was and had been watching her and made threats to her that they could find her again. Um, and so with that, it was just the statements that led to... But what was going on? What was the actual crime you were convicted of? Was this a home invasion? Was this a CSC in progress? What? I, I don't know that, um, but that's not... I don't think that that's what's determined to the crime as long as it's a felony. That's all that matters. Um, what matters is what the defendant said to um, make it more fearful for the victim. In, this, in that case, uh, the Court of Appeals did find that that was the case. Um, going up and beyond that necessary the crime. And in this case, it's the same. Um, he's trying to make the victim feel hopeless, uh, feel like he has all the control. Um, and that would naturally increase the fear of anybody suffering um, an act like this. I know you've read the impact statement, and I know you'll do it again. Um, but obviously, this is a very violent crime occurring in front of two very young children. Um, when you say that they said, uh, among those children, I, I, mean, I couldn't imagine what she would think other than even more worried um, when he's saying these things. 
All right. Now, I'm not familiar with that McDonald case, and I, I certainly would not rely on it without knowing more about the facts and then the statements made, how they are in conjunction to what was going on. So I just got to say right now, I don't know what's going on in the front row there, but you're making a lot of noise. I've tried to ignore it, all that I'm going to ignore, because if you're going to be in the courtroom, you're welcome to be in the courtroom, but you have to comply with the decorum of the courtroom, which means not being loud enough that you're distracting the attorneys in the court. And that's certainly what's going on. So that'll be the one warning. And otherwise, if you can't abide by the decorum of the court rule, then you can go now and that'll be the end of it. If you want to stay, you're welcome to stay, but you got to do it in a manner that is appropriate. All right. So I would not rely on it without knowing the facts of what was going into the crime, what the crime was, and then how that relates to the statements. In this descriptive narrative, it's clear to me that there is a back and forth as it relates to the phone. There's a back and forth between the parties as it relates to this assault that was ongoing. Um, and I just don't see the 50 points. Again, I understand that the authority is a pretty high bar um, and I don't see it here. So respectfully decline to amend that. So Mr. Butler, anything else on scoring? Uh, no, that is for him. Okay. Then um, with that, Mr. Frank, I'll go back to you. Do you believe we have accurate information on what should be sounding? I do. All right, so now back to you, Mr. Butler, do you have anything on behalf of the victim or the people? Yes, Your Honor, I think the um, victim in this case, I really would like to address the court. All right, so Mr. Frank, I'll give you a comment of a seat, and then Haley, you can come on up to the podium, and when you get there, state your full name, spell your last name for the record. My name is Haley Ronan. I'm the victim of this case. Can you spell your last name just so we have it? R O N A N. All right, go ahead. Um, at this point, I'm just going to be brief. So, since February 25th, I had never feared being going outside or going to bed or closing my eyes. I'm sorry. I saw I never thought that he would hurt me the way that he did. I am not taking medication for my PTSD. And I have to take sleeping pills because I can't sleep because I'm too afraid to close my eyes. I look over my shoulder and I panic because I'm afraid I'm gonna turn around and he's gonna be there. I will always appreciate that he gave us my two beautiful children. And they're doing great. So great. But if this, I need to know, I would like him to have supervised visits with the kids just so I know that they're safe. And I do not feel safe being able to meet him by myself. I need supervised visits to do anything like that. He, he brought a lot of damage on me and even showing pictures of him to my kids, my son will smack me in the face or he'll hit me or he'll try and hurt his sister. I just, I just want him to know that I thought I was supposed to spend the rest of my life with this man. And I thought I could trust him. I never thought he would do that to me. It just scares me. That's all I can say. But I just, I just want him to realize that nobody ever deserves to be on their last breath. Me thinking that I'm going to lose my children or my wife. That's all I have to say. All right, Mr. Butler, do you have anything else on behalf of the people? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, well, I kind of was interviewed in this case, and he did, he did speak to the police. Um, he referenced his, the fact that he has multiple personalities, and then he referenced his quote, demon personality that came out. That's, that's what was kind of responsible for all this. Um, again, it's not in the PSI, but what's also not in the PSI is an indication of any mental health issues. Um, so I'm not really sure what's going on with the defendant. If this is drug induced, if he does have mental health issues, if 
uh, what the case is. Um, but to have a situation like this, when there's no allegation of drugs, no prior criminal history, um, and then to have a violent offense like this happen to the mother of his children, both of were in the home at the time, very young children, uh, is, is very concerning uh, behavior. It, it's unique behavior. Um, it's just that we don't see very often without something else going on as well. Um, what I'm also concerned with is the guidelines. It's, it's shocking to me that a assault regulation is going to be a zero to 11 guideline range, um, but that's because of this lack of prior record variables, really, um, despite the fact that this is a class D um, felony. Um, the, agree the agreement is for a fill through sentence from the guidelines, so that's zero to 11. The recommendation in this case is to serve four days jail, four days serve. That's the recommendation from MTOC, um, along with probation of two years. Um, I think because of the uh, violent nature of this offense, as well as the um, just concern about the mental health of the defendant's statements made to the police, the lack of drugs being involved, and this is being an outlaw offense. I think this should, should be a longer term of supervision. Um, and I would advocate for definitely a, a longer term of jail. And I certainly would not advocate for any modification to the no contact order, despite the victim saying that she wants to have supervised visitation with children. I, I think he needs to get himself in a much better spot first and demonstrate that the court is not a threat um, while on probation before there's any humor in the modification of the no contact order. Mr. Franklin. Your Honor, as we saw earlier, um, dealing with the Attorney General, I like when I work with the Attorney General. The Attorney General has policies. And I can reasonably look at my client and say, well, you're charged with this case, uh, this particular crime, and you can pretty much expect this, this, and this, because that elected official ran out of platform, and here's the policies. I don't agree with all the policies, but they do have policies. I have no standard of advice typically to give my clients prior to getting an offer in this county. Even with driving on a suspended license, I don't know if we're going to be able to get their license and get a civil infraction. We're going to do jail. We're going to do this. I don't know. A first offender, no criminal history, otherwise eligible for HIDA. Generally, this court said if eligible, the court grants HIDA. It's not part of the offer. It's very frustrating in this case. Everywhere else I've been, first time offender, they get the keys to the kingdom, as this court has said many times, in their possession. Keys to the court back. Okay. All right. One year, exactly. It's a carrot, right? It's a carrot at the end of probation for my client to go after. But instead, we went right for the stick. But if you're not successful, risk. For a first time offender. And so I asked, I mean, we negotiated long and hard on this case. Why, why, why? Why no hide up? There was drugs involved. It, it's in the, the police report that their method of stress, uh, detox, and relaxation was to go in the closet and get the damn ring. More on that in a minute. Why? Because his conduct was so egregious. It is a strangulation case. He admitted he put his hands on the complaining witness's throat. He admitted he choked him. A man should never do that. Not to anyone, especially not to the mother of his children. A man is a protector. But let's put this into context a little more. Unfortunately, as we all know, strangulation does happen on a spectrum. At the worst end, murder. That's not this case. At the other end of the spectrum, we have contact, pressure. Now, I saw the video. I don't remember seeing bruising. There may have been bruising. There may have been red marks. Okay. I'm not going to talk about that. There was some type of injury. I, I don't doubt that. I'm guessing if there had been a significant injury, we would have heard about blood vessels rupturing and all of that that the prosecution would be talking about. But I don't recall watching the body-worn camera. The complaining witness never complains of pain. She did have complaints. In her initial statement to police and in the comments that she made on the body-worn camera, her first thought goes to, how am I going to pay for all this stuff? How am I going to provide money? You know, basically, how will I get through life without having Mr. Thayer pay these bills? A legitimate concern. I just find a strange that that is the first concern. 
Those thoughts were closer in time to the incident. And as time has passed, the statement that the court heard today uh, has changed. There are new layers, and it, the incident seems to be more egregious now than initially when it was reported. And I'm, I'm just saying that initially it seemed a piece of sand, but today a pearl is presented to the public. And I'm not being mean, I'm not victim shaming. I'm just pointing out that the testimony has changed a little bit over time. And my client has to be this demon or this devil. And that's that's how we're justifying that he can't have Haida. He has to be so bad that he can't have Haida. It's possible that he could have Haida and he'll be successful. I really think he would be successful. But what also this narrative does, it helps out if, if this is true, if he's really the worst person ever, he's so bad that his first time out, he can't have Haida. You know, that's really good when we're going down to the front of the court and we're deciding things like custody and child support. But you have two young, unmarried individuals with children. One works, one doesn't. Understand that child care, extremely expensive. That from personal experience. Now, these are not two people living their best life, okay? And certainly, they are not appreciating the two beautiful gifts from God that they have. They have two children there. And I don't know why that's not enough. But instead of seeing these blessings, they saw stress and chaos, and they chose to de-stress by doing marijuana. Let's go in the back closet and do some hits on the dab rig. Marijuana takes your garbage. They're an absolute light on our community. And I, I'm continually disappointed in the people of the state of Michigan for legalizing it. I, I know very few people who can do marijuana recreation on the weekend and then go back to life as no mama. Most of the people I know that are involved in marijuana are daily users. And, and it's disgusting to me that the people have made it so easy for people to become addicted and have an avenue to supply that addiction. But that's, that's the kind of people that the court is looking at here. These are people that are stuck using substances. And dabs are especially awful. They're a lot more potent. But it's, it's common knowledge. Like, marijuana induces paranoia. We know that. The culture makes fun of people for smoking marijuana and being paranoid, okay? Which probably explains some of the fear that the complaining witness talked about, okay? If they're doing the marijuana and they're paranoid, it heightens things. But these two were doing the marijuana because they wanted to feel something. And this is disturbing because you've got a couple of beautiful children in the house that neither... Uh, feels enough satisfaction from, so they're, they're resulting to getting high in the closet because the kids aren't enough. These are two people in a dark place. It's a dark place. So rather than see the situation for what it is, my client's being framed as the devil. And this is dangerous thinking. And it's not productive for either party, my client or the complaint witness. If my client is the devil, then Ms. Ronan doesn't have to take responsibility for her actions. She misses a growth opportunity. It takes a lot of strength to look at your partner in the face and say, honey, this isn't working for me. We're splitting up. We're not gonna be in a relationship anymore. It's a lot easier to blame someone else for your life not going the way you want it to be. And branding my client as the devil, you know, that's an is statement. And that's why it's so awful for him. This is what he be, it's a state of being. And we know from the current culture, identity is a very powerful thing. More terrifying, however, is an identity that is imposed by the community and you're denied height. What you tell them. So the community says he's a devil, he's not good enough to get height up. What kind of mindset is he gonna walk around for the rest of his life? He's a young man. You know, his reward for you know behaving himself uh, through those years of compulsory height, where I could ask the court to give it to him over the objection of the prosecutor. He behaved himself, and his reward is well, you behave yourself so you don't get height. Well, it has to be a devil to justify this offer. And there was no way this was ever going to go to trial. He admitted it. He took responsibility. So, but what are you going to worse off at trial? He pled his charge, didn't he? He pled to the most severe charge. And the DV. What would have done the repercussions for trial? Took responsibility for the crime. I mean, that's you, you can't get high with no confidence. You have to say, I did it because the state of Michigan wants young people to admit what they did wrong. You can't get it because Mr. Buck is not confident. I don't know. He's not too old. 
has to be before your 21st birthday. No, they amended the statute. It's up to 26 now. So, to refresh my recollection, the amendment then still requires prosecutor approval from 21 to 26 something. It does. Yeah. All right. You know, the situation here, you got Ms. Ronan, she throws a plate at my client. It's, he he headbutts her, and then she politely asks him to move out of his way. Um, it, the testimony from her perspective is so bubble wrapped, it's hard to understand what she did. She's trying to insulate herself, and, and rightly so. My client went to the police, he said, this is what I did, and then he downgraded what she did. He said, no, she didn't throw a plate. He was trying to protect her. It's not the case that he just randomly started choking her. They had a dysfunctional relationship. He shouldn't have done what he did. He should have left the house. But my client has all the marks of a person who's going to complete probation successfully. I wish it was with Haida. I wish, I wish we had a standard in this county where I could look at my client with the first offense and it's not the crime of the century, which this is not, and say, we can try to go for Haida. Don't screw up again. Go on, have a good life. I think anger management, counseling, relationship classes, these are all things that he's going to take and use and become a better person. It's just unfortunate that the goal here is to saddle young Haida eligible men with felony convictions, which is almost a guarantee that a child, in this case children, they're going to lose their father in their life. So I would ask the court to give my client a chance, put him on probation, and let him have the extra difficulty of life of navigating it without a high school diploma and a felony conviction. All right, Mr. Thayer, anything you want to say before the court imposes sentence? I would just like to apologize to Haley if that's possible, sir. You can say whatever you'd like. Yeah, then I'm truly sorry for everything I did while pain and suffering. All right, so interesting case. I will say this when I read this. Um, it's accurate. I, I just don't see what happened here in the big picture. We handle we handle a lot of assault with attempt to create bodily harm, less than murder, and here's the key, or by strangulation. So it's a great big 10-year felony that didn't used to be applicable to very many cases until they did the or by strangulation. And Mr. Franklin has kind of honed in on that. That becomes a sore uh, as it relates to generally men and domestic violence situations and probably often is warranted. But again, going back to the big picture as it relates to what happened here, certainly very scary for Haley. But when I compare it to other cases of GBH or by strangulation, it's relatively benign compared to much of what we see. I also share the I guess, complaints over the years about who gets offered what and why, this case not being much different. So apparently the offer was please charge, uh, meaning not only are you gonna eat the felony, you're gonna plead to the misdemeanor too. Now, it would make sense to plead to the misdemeanor if you got YTA on the count of one, but I, I don't get it. And it's not the court's bailiwick anymore other than I call it out when I see it generally. Sometimes I just give up, I get tired of it. Um, but it does not seem very fair to both sides when you don't even have that opportunity. And I'm going to say that because Mr. Thayer, in spite of everything that happened here, stands before the court with no prior criminal history. And he's 25 years old. So that means he's made it through all those teen years, through all those early 20s, almost to the point where science and our Supreme Court now and where we're going in the justice system would say, your brain is almost fully developed. They'll tell you that doesn't happen until you're 26. And there's a steady march in today's world where it hasn't made it to assault and intent to great bodily harm by uh, lesson murder or by strangulation yet, but certainly it's made it in the context of murder. You could murder somebody and they would say, oh no, we can't give you life without parole to 17 year old. That's, that's cruel and unusual punishment. Your brain's not fully developed. Our Supreme Court is taking up Right now, if we haven't already, that's going to then be extended to 18-year-olds. And then I can guess where that goes next. Eventually, at some point, that'll make it all the way out, probably until 26, because your brain doesn't develop until you're 26. And that's sort of the 
philosophy of where we're going in the criminal justice world. So I, I don't understand when somebody's eligible why they don't get for a lesser charge that same opportunity. Now, the flip side of that, if you've been sitting in here all morning, at some point, you'd probably be able to come back and ask to have this set aside. And again, with that swing left, even if the court thinks that's a bad idea at the time, and even if Haley comes in and says it's a bad idea, a new case seems to say, well, too bad, circuit court, too bad, trial judges. The Supreme Court has determined that in the public welfare doesn't mean anything about what a victim thinks. It just means you're going to grant. I don't know why they will make it automatic in spite of what's happening. I guess those are all bigger topics that are sort of on point here, but really outside of the parameters of sentencing you are interesting to think about as it relates to a case like this. I will say this, Mr. Thayer, Mr. Franklin has honed in on something that, again, is not in the report. So it seems that both sides have mentioned this. If there was this idea of drug use, meaning marijuana, dabs in particular, that is a dead end to nowhere. I share his frustration. We lose that argument about marijuana when we allow all these states 15, 20 years ago to put the word medical in front of marijuana. Um, Cause it's just not accurate 99.9% .9 of the time. And while science will tell us that marijuana is not a gateway drug, I don't know that Mr. Butler, Mr. Franklin, or the court respond. It's hard to identify somebody who has an addiction to drug, a hard drug, that didn't start with marijuana. There are those instances back in the Oxycontin days where somebody had a knee surgery, for instance, and they give them the Oxycontin and then they develop a severe addiction to opioids. But as far as meth, cocaine, a lot of the other hard drugs, it's hard to read a PSI where they don't start with marijuana. And the marijuana normally is preceded by alcohol. So I, I guess people smarter than I can show you the science behind why it's not true that it is a gateway drug, but it's certainly not what we see here. So that means that for you, I don't know if Haley's involved too or not, but for both of you, or certainly for you, you're a guy's going to have probation. It's just a dead end of nowhere, and it's not going to help you be successful on supervision, be successful in relationships, or as a father. It did not and I think the time and our experience here bears that out. Now, as it relates to supervision, I, I, when I prepare these, you're 25, you have no prior criminal history. I think that this report here and its recommendations are appropriate. And now that I had the benefit of them listening to the arguments as it relates to an appropriate sentence, Nothing has changed, at least from the court's perspective. I keep going back to the idea you don't have any criminal history. And if I could, I would give you delayed sentence. I would give you YTA. I'd give you any first class to I could because you would hold the keys to that. It should have that opportunity to not have a felony conviction. It clearly can impact your ability to earn a living. And that clearly then impacts your children and indirectly impacts Haley, right? The less productive you are, meaning ability to earn, the worse it is for those two kids, and in kind, the worse it is for Haley. Now, as it relates to that, you've got to be very careful here. It sounds like to me, based on what I'm hearing in the argument, certainly not contained in the uh, PSI, but you two don't have a FOC case. That's something that's going to have to occur, right? You're not married, correct? So that's got to occur. Uh, almost immediately so that there can be some sort of parameters in place as it relates to custody, parenting time, all those issues. Now, maybe you two can reach agreement on that, but the risk with that is things might be great tomorrow and then two months from now, you're in love with somebody else or she's in love with somebody else and then one of you is upset about that and things go south. It's just sometimes easier to have the FOC spelling out in great detail, how things are going to go for you two. Now, to the extent that the court much prefers parents to make that decision, if you can, and lots of parents can, um, sometimes that just doesn't work out, and particularly if you got one of the parents on supervision. Lots of things go sideways 
uh, in that scenario for lots of different reasons, right? Sometimes this conviction will be used as a sword by the other. Um, so there's just a lot of things that make it difficult. So one or both of you ought to be thinking about filing the appropriate motion and getting that set in stone, so to speak, in writing. Mr. Thayer, I am going to follow this recommendation. It is appropriate. I'm going to place you on a period of supervision for two years. Now I'm not going to go over all the terms of your supervision. I'll highlight some of the ones that I think are most important. And we'll start with this. And we'll require that you complete domestic violence and battery intervention programming. Um, and you'll follow all the recommendations of that as you go through. And I'm also going to require that you complete the CONC program. I think that certainly can help you as it relates to decision making. That's a a program that's designed to help illuminate you on how folks go about, how you go about making decisions, and how you might make better decisions in the future. I'm also going to require, now this is going to be very difficult because you're a parent, and it's going to be difficult for Haley too, but I am going to follow this recommendation and require there to be no contact, verbal, written, electronic, or physical, with Haley Rowan, either directly or through another person, and you can't even be within 500 feet of her school residence or place of employment. Now that makes it hard to be a dad. Again, we're going to need some orders, most likely from the FOC. That also means as it relates to visitation with your kids, you're going to have to somehow work through a third party. Okay. That does not mean you cannot see your kids. And there would be nothing about this supervision that I would do that would prevent you from seeing your kids after the FOC has had those hearings determine what appropriate custody and visitation and parenting time, all that stuff should look like, all right? Generally, it's always preferred that that's just 50-50, right? You have shared legal custody, shared physical custody, and equal parenting time. Mom, you can shake your head no, but that's the way that it works, okay? This conviction does not mean he doesn't get to be a father. And to the contrary, you'll see lots of probate law that gets overturned all the time on termination of parental rights. That's just the way it's going today. The, the pendulum is swinging left. So we can shake our head no, but that's not what the appellate courts are saying. So that's the way that will be viewed in the FOC, any FOC, and that's the way this court views it because that's the current status of the law. No, nope, no. Nope. So you can talk to Mr. Butler about it when you're done. However, that's going to be a problem for you, okay? So again, somebody's going to have to get over there and get some um, uh, parameters put in place. Once you do that, the obvious option, I'm just speaking out loud for both sides here, there are apps that the FLC use, app close, parent wizard, things like that. I will amend this once the FLC order is in place to allow you to have contact with Haley through the app. What the app does is it tracks both parties communication, one of the other, basically it's a texting app, all right? So it protects her, it protects you. All those communications get, get preserved and then either side can then say to the FOC or the court, aha, it's Thayer that's the problem or aha, it's Haley that's the problem or maybe it's neither one that has a problem. Maybe you just need to figure out a way to communicate better. It also has calendars that both sides can put in, okay, you know, I don't know your kid's name, Johnny and Mary have, cheerleading practice on these dates and at some point the first three days it's her days and the next days it's basically so you can keep track of things together what that looks like as far as medical appointments school activities all of those things those are unfortunate realities for the two of you coming down the pike here okay but right now no contact obviously while you're on supervision you can't engage in any assault or threatening or violent behavior. I'm going to require that you maintain employment of at least 30 hours a week or a combination of the employment and your supervision obligations. I'm also going to require a curfew. So you have to be in your approved residence between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. unless you first have permission to be outside uh, your, your residence during those approved hours. If you have employment during those hours, you need to clear the probation first, right? It's going to prevent you from working. Yeah, yeah. So as it relates to Fines, costs, and other monetary obligations, the court is required by statute to impose $118 in state costs. And that's broken down $68 on a felony, $50 on that domestic violence misdemeanor. You also have to pay a $60 DNA testing fee. There'll be attorney fees in the amount of $400, court costs of $550. While you're being supervised over these two years, your supervision fees are going to be $30 per month. I'm also required by statute to impose $130 crime victims assessment. 
And then finally, sir, I'm going to file this recommendation. It is appropriate. You're going to be sentenced to four days in the county jail credit for four that you have previously served. All right. You do have a right to seek appellate public review of your sentence. If you'd like to do that, you have 21 days from today's date to make that request. If you want a court appointed attorney to assist you, you have 42 days. So I'm going to place this in the file. Are you prepared to make any payment on those fines and costs today? No. Okay. Did you post a bond? I partially, I, my grandpa gave a thousand and I've been paying on the other thousand as we've been going okay. through this. So to the extent a bond needs to be returned, some of that can be applied to your fines and costs. Okay. Grandpa here with you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any of that going to be applied to the fines and costs? How much? Yes. To do a bail. Oh, bail bondsman. So that's not going to help you. All right. So what do you think you can pay a month? Pay probably 150 a month. 150. Are you working? Yes. Okay. Is that full time? Yes. All right. So why don't we start at 150? You can always pay more if you have more. Right. If you are not going to be able to make a payment for some reason, don't just ignore it. Talk to probation. Talk to collections. Um, and we'll see what we can do to accommodate that if possible. All right. So. We'll set you up on a payment plan. I need you to check in at Circuit Court Probation. That's at 309 West Adams. Do not leave town without first checking in at 309 West Adams. Okay, you know where that's at? All right. So what I want to do then also is caution. That's going to complete the matter. So I'm going to ask for you to hang on a minute with your attorney. I'm going to ask for these folks to exit. I got a court security guy here. We need to do that in an appropriate manner, Mr. Butler. Yeah, just before we walk right in this case, Your Honor, I was informed by the mother of the children that there is an FOC case in Genesee County that's already. Um, well, perfect. So then both of you are free, going to be free to file whatever motions you think are appropriate. There's no contact order. All right. So it's unfortunate that's not in Ioni County, but in general, I think if you bring up to the FOC that this court is going to amend your bond order to allow contact through one of those apps, they should generally do that. They're, this conviction should not prohibit you from being a parent to your child. Do you have any idea how it ended up in Genesee County? I live there. Okay, so what happened to our venue here? She must have moved there. Yeah, uh, she moved his. So after this incident, when I went to jail, uh, her mom and her boyfriend came and picked her up and, and moved to jail. Out there. So I filed it in the most convenient location. You're all set. There's not a six-month residence requirement. Okay, what do we have next? 